Welcome to the Impact Central Summer Showcase 2022. It is so fantastic to have everybody here tonight, and we have a fantastic evening planned. As you know, this is the best impact event in London, the UK, and possibly the world. So the reason it's going to be such a great evening is because we have air conditioning. So sit back, stay cool, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what we have planned for you this evening. We have some amazing special guests joining us tonight. We have Renko Hempenius. Remco is the uh, global head of strategic expansion for IKEA, and he's going to be talking to us a bit about their sustainability initiatives at I IKEA. We're also going to be joined by Annika Wallington, the founder of Recognized, an amazing uh, impact company and a alumni of Impact Central. And as a special treat that I'm not going to divulge too much, I'll just say we have a little refreshment activity in the middle that's going to be a lot of fun and everybody's going to really enjoy. So, but of course, the stars of the evening are our five founders of Cohort 9. We are halfway through our uh, six-month accelerator program. And uh, we are so excited to have you meet them tonight. And they're going to tell you about their amazing businesses and their amazing impact. And I just want to say it's, it's always such a pleasure to be able to watch them on Showcase Night and see all that hard work that they've been putting together to come to fruition and, and to share that with all of you tonight. So super excited. My name is Gordon Eichhorst. I'm one of the founders of Impact Central, along with Sarah Louise Martin and Ian Smart. And it is hard to believe that only three months ago we were here celebrating Showcase 8. And I say it's hard to believe because it feels like in those three short months the world has completely changed. The conflict in Ukraine has now become a global issue, right? I mean, we have fuel and food shortages that are hitting the most vul vulnerable countries and the most vulnerable individuals. And we're dealing with potentially... Uh, you know, life-threatening situations there. We have inflation that's rampant around the globe. And here in the UK, we have a leadership contest, so who knows what's going to happen with the government. So we were talking three months ago about social and environmental issues that are really important, yet it seems like everything's been put on the back burner. And we need to bring that to the front. Because we have hope for a better world. Like, isn't that why we're here? And we know we have challenges, but we also know that we have solutions. And so um, we decided to pick a theme for this evening, and that theme is Seeds of Change. And the reason we picked that theme is because sometimes we can feel that in our own ways that we think we can try to solve some of these really daunting problems that we're, we're just insignificant. We can't make a difference. We have huge problems that are out there and yet we feel that we can't make a ch you know, address them. And I'm just going to read uh, a poem that was written by a guy named Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. And he was a Jesuit priest, but also a world-famous paleontologist. And in, um, in 1921, he was part of the team that actually discovered Peking Man. And he has some interesting views on evolution, as you would think. And I just want to share a, uh, a poem that he wrote, an excerpt from a poem called Trust. And he writes, We are quite naturally impatient in everything to reach the end without delay. We would like to skip the intermediate stages. We are impatient of being on the way to something unknown, something new. And yet, it is the law of all progress that it is made by passing through some stages of instability. And that it may take a very long time. And so I think it is with you. Your ideas mature gradually. Let them grow. Let them shape themselves without undue haste. Don't try to force them on as though you could be today what time will make of you tomorrow. And the reason that I really like this poem it, is because it talks about the need for nurturing the growth of new ideas. And we certainly need some new ideas. You know, we, we know that there's no quick fixes. So we need some new ideas in terms of how we're going to deal with some of these social challenges and how we're going to collectively work on the environmental issues that we know we're all facing. And 
All of us at Impact Central believe that impact businesses are actually one of the key ideas that we need to put forward mo most of all. And the reason is, is that, yes, businesses do need to grow and have you know, revenue in order to thrive, et cetera. But if all we're asking of business is to maximize their profit, I think we're selling them short. I think we can do a lot better than that. We have a lot better ideas than that. And in fact, tonight, you're going to hear from five amazing founders who have businesses that have for profit. They have profitable business plans, but they also have impact as part of their business. So as you're listening to their presentations tonight, I'd like you to think about our theme, which is seeds of change, and think about what are the seeds that you could be nurturing to deliver the world that you want to be living in. So I'll leave that with you guys. And now it is my great pleasure. Please join me in welcoming our first speaker of the evening, Yasmin from Hira. Thank you for coming. My name is Yasmin, and I'm the founder of Hira. When my son was 15 months old, he experienced a development delay. Turning to, sorry, <laughs> um, Googling his development delay brought back 76 million results. Asking my mom friends for advice, well, that was a bad idea as well, as every single one of them had a different opinion as some mothers in this room might know. The worst of all happened, though, when I reached out to my GP. We went to his clinic, set up an appointment, my husband and I, raised our concerns, and he sent us away and didn't take our concerns seriously. I was scared, I was worried, I was overwhelmed, and I really didn't know what to do next. Then my husband and I, I'm sitting right there, <laughs> decided to go down the private care route. We know we were extremely lucky to be able to do that. Cutting a very long story short, our child did experience a development delay, but we were able to catch it early, and early intervention meant getting him back on track quickly. One in eight children in the UK experience a development delay. Look around you. <laughs> Just count. <laughs> so, is this child's development on track? That's the big, quest, the big $1 million question that carers, parents, GPs, and educators ask over and over again as they're posed with the child's growth. The reason it's so difficult to answer that question is because monitoring a child's development is complicated. It's not as easy as just tick, tick, tick on a checklist. It sometimes go back, goes forward, back, it's not linear. That's where Hira comes into the picture. If the slide comes to visit. <laughs> Hira is a baby clinic in your pocket. It's a child development app that monitors um, pediatric milestones, supports families through their child's early growth, and does the, all of that by having pediatric professionals monitoring the profile. So you have ongoing peace of mind that your child's health is on track. How do we do it? So, <laughs> in HERA, parents actually act as the bridge um, between the child and our medical practitioners. What we do is parents support us through logging in information, such as development milestones, growth tracking data such as height, weight, and head circumference. They give us further data around journal logging, tell us what the temperament of their child is and the things that they're going through on a day-to-day -day basis. They also support us through uploading audio, video, and image inputs. So we can actually see that it's a healthy crawl there. It's good that they crawled, that's fantastic, but we want to see that it's also a good crawl. Once we have that wealth of data, we can do something with it. So what we do, we have medical practitioners on our end that actually review the profile and create a development plan for that child. Once a month, parents receive reassurance that everything is on track. But sometimes things aren't on track. And in that case, 
we actually, we, we either do two things, depending on the delay. The first is, if it's something that needs immediate medical intervention, we'll send them to their GP. But in a lot of cases, we're able to help. And then we create a personal intervention plan with tips and tricks and activities for that child's development. So, 80% of our brain develops between the ages of zero to three, making that time frame the time to catch a child if something is off. It's the best time because that's when our, both our mental and physical health is determined. So this is a very busy slide, get ready for it. <laughs> I'm gonna put you on a little imagination game. There's a child named William. He has a very common cognitive development delay, but he goes undiagnosed. What does that actually look like? So, he's three years old, he's at nursery, he fights a lot, he's not making good social contact with other children. He's fussy, um, which sounds like a lot of three-year-olds so far for any parents in the room. So it's pretty easy to miss a development delay, but we're monitoring him ongoingly, so we know what's going on. By the age of reception, William is four and a half months behind his counters developmentally. By the end of primary school, he's almost a year behind his counters. His mom needs to leave her job because she needs to attend to him and with all of the troubles that he brings to the table. And that means a loss of income for the family. So it influences that family for time and time again for their future. William grows up and he has depression. He finds it hard to hold a job. He's being supported by the NHS and by his local community, but it isn't easy. Now imagine the exact same child. William is three years old. <laughs> we suspect at HERA that there might be a development delay. Our pediatric team creates a development report and lists exactly what's going on in his life and reports to his GP to tell him exactly why we think he needs further intervention and to see a medical practitioner for diagnosis. And William then has a perfectly normal and happy life. He's diagnosed 16, later, 16 weeks after we refer him on, and he, he does have a development delay, but early intervention meant early help, and early help meant that throughout his school years he was supported. So he's happy. <laughs> the thing is about that, that William's first story isn't that, is very common. And actually, the cost to the UK economy of lost opportunity due to development delays that go undiagnosed is 16 billion pounds annually. Not over a lifetime, annually. That's what we lose. That's five times the amount that we invest in our early years for the entire UK. So, our roadmap. <laughs> I'm really excited to say that in my pocket, there's already a little baby clinic sitting there. <laughs> um, we launched our alpha version last week, and we're beginning beta testing in September. We're parents here, and August isn't really a month of work. <laughs> Um, we hope to get our um, product ready for the market by January 2023. And we have very ambitious five-year pla five plans. So the first one is our five-year plan is to actually be integrated within um, the NHS and other health systems in the world, world cutting out the middleman and having GP clinics receive a ding, ding, ding that there's a problem and that uh, this child should see this professional. So that's our first action. It'll save money for the NHS, it'll save time off GP clinics that are very busy, et cetera. Our second ambitious um, activity within the next five years is to support data, research, and the future of diagnostics of development delays. So we're already working with various researchers around the globe in order to integrate machine learning into the product and introduce early diagnostics to the world of child development. Our ambitions don't come cheap. <laughs> um, we're looking to raise 750,000 pounds in order to get us through the next 18 months of our life cycle. Um, we're raising these funds from the usual 
um, angels, investor, um, angel investors, or VCs, but we're also going the, down the non-traditional route. So if anyone has links to foundations or other individuals or companies that are interested in supporting the future of the children of the world, we're happy to go down that route as well. Um, we're also looking for medical practitioners, hospitals, um, GP clinics, and um, trusts, hospital trusts, that would be interested in partnering with us and getting the word out there about all our work and partnering in any way they may see. The last thing we really need is for people in the tech industry that have any advice for how to build a great product to get in touch. Thank you so much for coming. Impact Central would not be Impact Central without the amazing faculty uh, who give tirelessly of their expertise. And I am so proud that we're able to call our next speaker a friend. He's been someone who has been a faculty member and part of our leadership module, and he's also been a mentor uh, for one of our startups uh, a couple cohorts ago. His name is Remco Hempenius, and as I mentioned earlier, he is the uh, strategic global, the global head for the strategic expansion division at IKEA. Unfortunately, uh, Remco's travel plans changed. As we know, there's a bit of travel chaos, so he is supposed to be in UK this week, but was not. Uh, but fortunately, SL, one of our co-founders, managed to catch up with him a couple days ago, and we've recorded that interview for you now. So, Tom, can you roll tape? Hi, Renko. It's absolutely wonderful to welcome you here to the Impact Central Showcase event. And we're so sorry that you're not able to join us in person. Where are you dialing in from? Uh, I would have loved to join you guys in person, but I am dialing in from Rotterdam, the Netherlands. Oh, so fancy. Um, so we're going to be talking about um, your really interesting experience at IKEA. And as you know, our theme for this evening is around um, being a seed for change. And we're looking at how we can do this individually and um, collectively when we come together through the work that we do via Impact Central. And also then what this means for big business playing its role as a responsible entity. Can you tell us a little bit more about IKEA's remit in this area of innovation and sustainability? Yeah, yeah, very good. Uh, I, I, I would say, and without sounding too, too arrogant, but uh, I would say that sustainability has been at the heart and the core of IKEA. We were probably not so very good in sharing the story, but the whole idea of, for instance, flat pack, so you can transport more also to lower the price, the way we have done production, how we utilize materials, has always been from um, a perspective of sustainability or actually a perspective of not wanting to waste anything. So that sits very much at the core from the first product we ever designed as IKEA. Of course, today there is much more focus on this topic and it's also growing quite a bit. It's not only about the products, it's also about your transportation, it's about your buildings, it's about your people, it's about where you produce. And of course, we are on the journey. And I would not say we're doing everything right, but we're doing a lot. And um, a few things that are just popping up now in my mind is one thing is, for instance, um, zero emission deliveries. Um, yeah. You know, last mile delivery has grown exponential, you know, for not only for IKEA, for many companies. And especially when you're coming closer where people live, you know, we need to make sure that we do that with the lowest impact to the environment. With the global footprint of somewhere like IKEA, there are obviously so many challenges in terms of supply chain materials and people. Um, and you've outlined some of the approaches that IKEA have taken. I would love to understand um, how you've maybe brought your own personal convictions into play in your role, because as you know, we're all responsible for um, stewarding the earth's resources. Um, yeah, what does that mean for you and how have you been able to do that? So we have been on this journey to actually deliver zero emission deliveries uh, throughout the world. And we have cities like Amsterdam and Vienna and actually uh, quite a few more where we already are 100% uh, delivering our products without actually creating an impact to the environment. The way, one way we're doing this, and I think that is also very much part of the change we are in as IKEA, is we do this in a kind of an open source development. Mm -hmm. So instead of just going to a supplier and say, I want to have X amount of uh, 
uh, electrical vehicles, we actually started to reach out to multiple companies and develop electrical vehicles in an open source environment, where it means that we don't own the IPs on some of the things we're doing, but really help to develop and to create speed to, to have more vehicles available for the, for the foreseeable future. So that is definitely one of the ways we are trying to impact. The other one is, of course, how we repurpose buildings, uh, not only building new, but also looking at you know, when we're opening up new customer meeting points, can we do that in a, in a, in a way that we have a, a lesser impact um, in how we build, but also how we utilize uh, buildings. So we are currently uh, uh, very much re repurposing buildings in a way that it has a, a lower impact than actually building new buildings. When we are building new buildings, we will do it with, you know, the best materials with, in ways that actually, uh, you know, will increase uh, our complete sustainable profile. How would you uh, encourage others to bring their own personal convictions around this area yeah. into the fore in terms of their own workplace? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, I don't think you have to be an activist, uh, although we like to be taking that activistic uh, approach in things we're doing, but really look into your sphere of influence. What can you do within your few square meters? Don't try to save the entire world at once. Uh, I don't think we need to do that, but, but there are, there, I, I'm sure that wherever you're working, wherever people are operating, wherever they are hanging out, there are little things you can do. And I think all these little things together will help to create the bigger impact. So I would really uh, dare people to, to, to look right in front of you. So what can I do in my sphere of influence, in my square meters, and how can I create a positive impact, even, with, even when it seems very little? Yeah, awesome, cool. Um, Tell us a little bit more about how IKEA is delivering on being an organization that stands for encouraging seeds of change and how it interacts with um, the environment, people and cities. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think change has been, um, an, 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 again, same way we are working with sustainability, we have been constantly changing and, and change is part of what we do. So we create an environment where change is embraced. So change is not seen as, 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 as a hostile action. Change is an integrated part. That also demands quite a lot from our leadership and a lot from our coworkers and our colleagues in, in how you drive change. Uh, and one way to, to do this is, of course, to listen. So I think one way to, 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 to sow seeds of change and to, to be part of change is really also to listen. Not only coming in with your own conviction and your own ideas, but also understand the environment and the, oper the world we operate in and, and then join together with others in this change. Because I think this is also one part where we are, you know, for many years, IKEA has done a lot of things on their own. We, you know, we are this big company, but we also know that if we want to accelerate change, if we want to accelerate transformation and, and doing things different, we need to do it together. So together with our suppliers, together with our retail markets, together with our customers and together with other companies and NGOs to actually make this happen. Amazing. And um, you've been working with startups, um, purpose-driven startups. You have been on faculty at Impact Central. Mm -hmm. You've also been a mentor here. What excites you about this space of purpose-driven startups right now? Uh, yeah, yeah. What excites me every time is uh, when I see the the genuine passion for creating business on one side and delivering a positive impact, and how can you bring these two together? And this is not about you know being an NGO as, as, as such, but really have a common business sense. And in driving business, taking different decisions that actually will then, you know, has a, have a better life for people or the product we're using or what we sell or who we involve in our business. I'm, I'm still super excited about the one. So and, I, and then the energy I see with, well, a lot of time, very young people that really want to do this quite without being selfish. So also really not only stepping in because, you know, now we're going to be, you know, multimillionaire. We're going to be the next Elon Musk, but really you know, as you said before, sowing those small seeds of change. And, and that excites me. The other thing that excites me is that, and especially working with these, with these uh, startups and, and social entrepreneurs, is that you're working very much on the cutting edge of developing business and developing yourself. Because it's not only about the business, but it's also developing yourself. And what I've seen also in the process uh, of, of doing startups and accelerated programs is that it's not only the, the business that is developing, but also people that are developing. And I think that is super, that is, 
I was, you know, I read, that brings a smile to my face when I see people grow into what they're doing and I actually become better people. Amazing. Um, what, what one thing can this audience do to best support the startups? Um, listen, I think listen, listen and listen before you actually bring in your own experience uh, before you bring your own knowledge into the conversation, but really start to understand what's behind the startup. Why are we doing this? So really go into the why. And then, yes, let's let's invest. Let's invest selflessness into these companies that want to do this. Uh, you know, you have a lot of knowledge for, especially if you have been in business for, for a while, you have experience. You most of the time, the same for me, you, you know how not to do things because we all have grown through to doing stupid things uh, and to make mistakes and to fail sometimes. So really bring that in. I, I always say, you know, I, I found out a few things later in life that I would have I, I would have wished I had a mentor or somebody next to me already when I was 20, 25 to, to guide me through some of these things. So, so let's invest together in these companies. But let's start by listening first. Why are they doing it? What is the reason behind it? What is the conviction why, why they want to make this happen? So tell us a couple of what those things might be if you were to talk to your 25-year-old self. I'm sure people would love to hear. <laughs> well, I, again, it's... It, the, the, you know, be who you are. I think don't try to imitate somebody else in your leadership, but also as a company. Be original, be authentic. I think that is incredibly important. Uh, don't, try to, don't try to conform uh, yourself to an environment that you, that you actually, you know, you're not, you are not that person. So I think that is definitely one of the big things. Uh, so be creative. Um, uh, I grew up as a, uh, you know, as being a graphic designer and in, in my early years in business, it was not very appreciated if you were too creative. But I would say be creative, be who you are, be authentic. I think that is super important. Awesome. And um, what percentage of your home furniture is made by IKEA? Oh, that's a good question. I would actually say 90%. Oh, cool. Amazing. Yeah. Awesome. Yes. You're living the brand. And final question for me, what is filling your hope tank right now? What is filling my hope tank right now? Um, I think hope fills my hope tank right now, uh, to be very honest. I am incredibly hopeful. I think we are in challenging times. Uh, I would actually say that, uh, and I, I know this sounds maybe um, um, naive, but when we were facing uh, COVID, which was challenging, and I know that some people have lost loved ones and it was not a nice period, but compared to COVID, where we are now two years in, into after since COVID happened, uh, the beginning was child play. And I think what we're seeing happening around us, you know, we've been talking about for the last 10 years about the VUCA world. This is the VUCA world. We are in uncertain times. We, you know, the geopolitical situation, the supply situation, uh, the sustainability part into it. Um, all these elements now coming together is shaking business. Yeah. But at the same time, that, that fills me with a, with a lot of hope because I've seen incredible resilience. I've seen incredible creativity. I've seen new things starting to occur. Um, and then also we know that not every company will make it. And we also know that not every startup will make it in this. But it, it fills me with hope because I think it, it brings us to a space where we need to think about those things that are really mattering to us. Yeah. And where it's not only about making money or becoming rich or, you know, have the biggest company or the most, you know, fancy organization, but really coming to a space where we're coming together, talking about the things that really matter to you as a human being, to us as human beings, but also to business. So I'm, I'm incredibly hopeful. At the same time, it is, it is, it's tiring. It, you know, I've never uh, experienced such uncertainty in taking business decisions, not only myself, but together with all my colleagues, not knowing what sits in front of us, even in the, in the coming six months. Yeah. Uh, but that also creates a lot of hope because that creates, you know, again, creativity, innovation, new products, new ideas that actually will bring us forward. So, yes, mm -hmm. that is what inspiring me. Amazing. Thank you so much, Remco. It's been an absolute joy mm -hmm. to speak with you and we look forward to welcoming you in person, hopefully very soon. Absolutely. Well, thank you so very much. It was really nice being with you guys. And uh, yeah, let's see each other next time. Yeah, cool. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye. All right. Thank you so much, Remco. It is unfortunate he couldn't be here in person, but I think from that interview, 
you got a sense of what an amazing guy he is in his honesty, but also I love the fact that he highlights creativity as such an important characteristic. And a huge thank you to SL for that great interview. Yeah. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming our next speaker onto the stage, Leslie from So Good. My name is Leslie So. I'm the founder of So Good Kombucha, and I am so thrilled to be here today to speak to you all. So what is kombucha? <laughs> well, the short answer is that it's a living fermented tea that tastes like a nice, sophisticated, fizzy drink, but it's actually good for your gut health, and it's a great substitute for alcohol or if you drink a lot of Coca-Cola. But the real answer is even more remarkable. Now get ready for this. This is a SCOBY, and that stands for Symbiotic Culture of Bacteria and Yeast. I know it looks a little bit like an alien, but it's actually an amazing multi-species ecosystem working together to create a drink that is so delicious and healthy that when it was discovered over 2,000 years ago in ancient China, it was known as the elixir of life. And kombucha is huge business worldwide. It's worth over $5 billion, and it's massive in, in, in North America, and Australia, and New Zealand. And in the UK, there's significant growth as well. So 92% uh, trend uh, over the last year in sales, as well as a market cap of 8.4 million pounds. It hits right on the trend of functional healthy drinks, as well as no and low alcohol as well. So I came across kombucha because my family has actually always brewed it, so I use the family recipe. Um, I was born in Hong Kong, and I grew up in Vancouver, Canada, and over 15 years ago, I moved to the UK um, to work for Rolls Royce PLC, and I've been fortunate to have had a really fantastic career, um, with my last job being the head of manufacturing for the biggest aerial engine test facility in the world. <laughs> so what made me leave my job? Well, there's a story there. Um, I actually, uh, the place that made the biggest impact to me, and um, these are all the places I actually lived and worked as part of my career at Rolls Royce, um, but the place that really made an impact to me was actually Sao Paulo, Brazil. It's an amazing city. Um, it's a place where there are glamorous high rises, but often in the same street, there's abject poverty. And I witnessed and saw firsthand just how much a good business can change lives how working at a reputable company like Rolls-Royce, even just being able to speak English, can lift entire families out of hopelessness and poverty. And that really gave me an impression and a vision that one day I want to be able to start a business where I could make a good product, do something that's good for the environment, and create good employment for refugees and others who are marginalized in society. Because work is so much more than just a wage. It offers purpose, it often gives people an, an opportunity where they feel like there's acceptance and belonging. And this is uh, Team Kombucha. <laughs> um, we are a very diverse uh, team indeed, um, both in age and ethnic by my, uh, background and education. Um, and clearly height as well. <laughs> um, many of the refugees that I work with and I've, I've had the pleasure of meeting uh, really lack confidence in English, but they make up for it in leaps and bounds with their resourcefulness, their diligence, their tenacity, and just this awesome positive attitude to be willing to start fresh somewhere new. And I, listen, the, what I want to do is to impact and empower many more people like that. Now, we've been trading for over a year now and have enjoyed great success and traction in the market. As you can see, I've had my mug on Sunday Times and we had celebrity endorsements and we've been to some amazing festivals and markets in the UK. Uh, and, you know, even though I still make most of the drinks myself, in fact, all of the drinks myself, <laughs> we've experienced huge growth in the last year, uh, uh, growth in sales of over 500%, um, sales of over 25,000 bottles, and stocks, stock is of over 50 across the UK. But if there's one thing that I've learned over the last year, apart from the fact that 
starting up a business is really hard work. <laughs> There's one, one key takeaway is that if I ever really want to achieve the impact I want to make helping the planet and, and helping refugees, then I really need to have scale. In fact, it's a nice picture here, but uh, and I'm sure you may have a chance to try some of kombucha later. <laughs> Um, but it, it, we need to be more than actually just the kombucha brand. So that brings me back to the SCOBY. A symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast is an ecosystem. So imagine we take that and build that into a ecosystem of symbiotic businesses, good businesses working together. And we're well on that journey to already. So I'm working with a B Corp supplier, and we're helping to, to fight food waste by using surplus or wonky or rescued fruits um, into our second fermentation. We're in very early talks with a social enterprise. Oh, sorry, that's the, that's the business. We're in early talks with a social enterprise um, to create biofuels that will help us uh, to become carbon negative in our operations. And really excitingly, we want to work with our customers. So bars and restaurants and gyms and farmhouses, farm shops, sorry, um, and for us to be able to help them develop their own better-for-you beverages using our technical expertise, our existing equipment and staff. Scale, what that will enable us to do is to reduce our unit costs, to spread our overhead, and most importantly, allow us to maximize our impact. Our ambition is to be the most sustainable startup bottling manufacturer in the UK. And our forecast is that this side of the business will actually exceed even our own kombucha brand's growth on a scale to five to one. A symbiotic environment of good businesses, changing lives, <laughs> lifting many people out of social um, benefit system into gainful employment and giving them hope and purpose. So that's my pitch. And if you have any experience at all in the food and drink industry, and if you've got any experience in sustainable manufacturing or packaging, or uh, if you are interested in doing your own startup brand, we can do some bottling for you, or anything else at all, we'd love to talk to you and welcome you to join our SCOBY. So thank you very much, thank you. Next up, representing the brand Beatrice Bayliss, we have Emily come to the stage. What's more important, diversity in your wardrobe or diversity in the environment? Now, this feral child is me, age three. If you told this nature outdoor loving child that in the space of 20 years, we would see a truckload of textile waste going to landfill every second and fashion becoming the second most polluting industry behind oil, I probably would have ignored you and continued trying to get this sheep's attention. I mean, isn't that what we've all been doing? Ignoring the problem, probably minus the sheep. Fashion, so when I was studying fashion at both school and London College of Fashion, I started to really understand what was happening behind the shiny facade of this industry. From enormous amounts of water consumption to contaminated water supplies, unfair working conditions and poor animal welfare, just to name a few, it was heartbreaking to not only discover that this was happening, but to also be contributing myself. The sustainable alternatives available to me were either from untrustworthy brands or too expensive. So this is where BB was born. I'm Emily Jane Bayliss, and I'm the founder of Beatrice Bayliss. We're on a mission to make sustainable clothing accessible to all. Fashion is about looking good, so the environment is probably the last thing you're thinking about when you're adding to your car or trying on in that hot changing room. <laughs> in that hot changing room. But the simple fact is, the environment is paying the price for what we're doing. A lot of clothes are made from synthetic fabrics. This means that they originate from oil and will take at least 200 years to decompose. This problem isn't going away and it's only going to get worse. However, this does also mean that we are in a good place to make a change. And Beatrice Bayliss can help you do this. <laughs> a bit about Beatrice Bayliss. We produce two main ranges. 
In this image, you can see the thoughtful range. This has feminine silhouettes and in intricate detailing. I'm wearing organic basics. These are made from organic cotton and inspired by lounge and comfortable wear. <laughs> Fashion is about looking good and Beatrice Bayliss will help you do this. We have multiple stockists worldwide and have gained much traction in the past two years. I founded the company in June 2020, which was probably a bit brave considering we were in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> but we have stocked with multiple brands across the world, including our commonplace in New York and Always Forever Green in the UK. This is just to name a few. We are planning on partnering with Wolf & Badger in the next few months, which is really exciting for us. <laughs> we want to continue spreading our message wider and further. We want more people around the world to have the opportunity to wear and experience Beatrice Bayless products and if you get your phone out and scan this QR code, you can follow us, you can talk about us, you can spread the BB message, and if you have any expertise and are interested in my company, slash baby, then please come and talk to me afterwards. So, if you only take one thing away from this evening, then remember, fashion is now ranked the second most polluting industry worldwide, and do not want to do your bit and buy sustainable. So, join BB and play your part. Thank you very much. I think it's incredible the amount of water that is used in a t-shirt and how you can uh, make that such a difference by picking better suppliers. Thank you, Getty. Uh, it is my great pleasure to uh, have the next speaker join me on stage. Uh, she is the founder of a business called Recognized, and Recognized makes uh, beautiful jewelry that supports powerful causes. And in 2021, she was named Young Businesswoman of the Year. And we are also extremely proud to be able to call her one of our alumni. Please welcome to the stage, Annika Wallington. Well, Annika, I wanted to um, start off by saying something important, because I think a lot of people, when they hear recognized, they think something like, oh, yeah, ch you know, charms that support good causes. Yeah, I get it. But recognized is so much more than that. And I thought it's really important, maybe you can explain to everybody what is the power of recognition? Great question. Well, I think to understand the power of recognition, you really have to understand first what recognition is. And our working definition of recognition, all that rhymes, um, is that recognition is about being seen for who you are, for what you bring, and the experiences in life that you faced or that you're facing. And that definition came about through a report that we commissioned last year as a brand called the Age of Recognition Report. And that report looked at the definition of recognition in today's society, why meaningful connections are so important, and really providing guidance on how we can all live a more thoughtful life, um, how we can give recognition, recognition to people around us. And the most, I guess, the biggest thing that came out of that report was that the power of recognition is to help people feel less alone. And we found that almost half of the UK, in fact, over half of the UK in the last year have felt alone. Right. That's huge. You know, it's half of this room, half of the UK. And really, that is the power of recognition. It's the most fundamental ingredient for solidarity. Yeah. Um, and when you have a society made up of people that feel alone, that's, that's a really big right. problem. And so as a brand, that is, that is really what we're trying to do. So right. back, to, back to your question, is it more than jewellery? You know, it really yeah. is. And... Um, you know, we spoke to over 100,000 customers in retail stores last year. And just to break that down for people, when you think of jewelry and mm -hmm. recognition, what does that all mean? You know, behind every person we speak to, there's a story. Um, and so just to give, and give, give you an example, um, in one of us, in one of our pop-ups last year, I was actually there, so this is one of my stories, but there's so many of these stories from our ambassador network. And a woman came by the pop-up and she, um, I talked her through the causes and I said, this is for, you know, this one's for mental health. And she burst, she just started crying and, and walked away. And an hour later she came back and she pulled me to the side and she said, um, I lost my son to suicide last year. And um, she said that he was 28 and he had two young children. And, you know, I, I, we, I guess what we do as recognizers, we hold right. space for people and their right. stories. And she, um, she ended up buying what I'm wearing, which is our mental health dove, 
with our bangle, um, and she came back from the till and she said, thank you for reminding me that there's so much hope amidst my pain. Right. This experience is like, you know, it's changed my life. So, so as you guys can see, a lot more than a charm bracelet. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Annika, and I think, you know, this is, it's, it, what you're talking about is, is so deep and important, and I'm sure people are wondering, you know, what, what brought you onto the path of founding Recognize? What was the inspiration for you? I suppose it's, it's slightly unusual. I actually had a dream. Um, so when I was at university, gosh, I feel like seven, eight years ago, like as you go up in your 20s, you suddenly get older. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're like, wow, that wasn't like three years ago anymore. It's actually like seven years ago or something. But I was home for the Christmas holidays and I, I literally went to bed one night and I had this dream. And in my dream, I saw a woman who had depression walking into a supermarket. And at the till point, she saw another woman wearing a bracelet that had a dove on. And I saw the words, I stand with you. And in that moment, the woman didn't feel as alone and had this moment of recognition in realizing that she wasn't the only one. And isn't that so true about our lives and what we go through? We're never the only one. Um, and so I went back to university mm -hmm. that term. Loads of my friends started talking to me about their mental health. And um, I mean, seven years ago, everyone would talk about their mental health only after they kind of come through their mental health. And so, you know, thank goodness a lot's changed today. Right. But back then it was, yeah. you got to conquer it before you talk about it. And um, I think one of my best friends came up to me and said, Annika, I've, I've just had depression for three months. And that's when it really clicked to me um, that myself and so many others were really struggling in silence. And mm -hmm. it got me thinking about the dream and I thought, Maybe there is something that you could wear that could right. give recognition. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so you, you uh, as I mentioned, uh, you were on our second cohort, and that was in spring of 2019. And after finishing the accelerator, you raised some capital, you got your uh, stand ready, and I think uh, you went to the Spirit of Christmas Fair. Mm -hmm. And tell us what happened at the Spirit of Christmas. So, I went off at Spirit of Christmas Fair to the toilet, <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and if anyone's ever done a show, oh my goodness, that you really do stand up all day, and you get really tired, so I genuinely was, like, I was just sat on the loo just to, like, rest my legs. <laughs> anyway, so 10 minutes later, I, you know, come back to the stand, and one of our ambassadors is like, Annika, you have no idea who's just been here. Oh my gosh, who's just been here? Um, and she says, you know, John Lewis has just been here. So which I'm like, for goodness sake, why was I on the loo? <laughs> 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 like, oh my gosh. Um, anyway, so they sent they send back another buyer the next day, which I think in my mind, I just knew it was quite serious. Like, why send someone back if you're not interested? Mm -hmm. And I spent half an hour with this buyer telling her all about Recognized. And within two days, I, we were in their head office speaking to them about you know, launching our brand nationally with John Lewis. And I think we prepared for every question, but what do you want? Isn't it so <laughs> funny? I think we often underestimate our worth as founders. And um, sometimes we get in front of really big brands like John Lewis and, and suddenly it's like, oh my gosh, you know, but actually I think you forget how much value, particularly yeah. purpose-driven brands have for businesses like that. And so, yeah, I think within two weeks we hosted our first ever pop-up with them. It was the first ever pop-up in the history of John Lewis wow. in their flagship, Peter Jones. Yeah. Um, and we sold five times more than any other jewelry brand. Has yeah, so I, I remember that. I remember yeah. visiting. That was amazing. <laughs> uh, it's like incredible. And that was Christmas in 2019. And so 2020 dawns. And you are in talks with John Lewis about a national tour, about going to all of their stores. And then COVID hits. Mm. And everything's canceled. Mm. So what do you do then? So, <laughs> yeah, COVID really, like, really got in the way of a lot of things, <laughs> didn't it? Um, yeah, I remember, actually, it's very clearly, because we'd literally launched our national tour, and we were back in Peter Jones, the first tour that we'd ever popped up, and we start, started the tour there, because where else would we start the tour? And we were supposed to go around all of their stores. And I remember literally, it was by the hour, wasn't it, that the news changed and then we were, mm. you know, packing down everything and it was just this most bizarre experience. And then I think you guys kicked us out of the office as well within 24 hours. <laughs> so we, <laughs> we packed down a pop-up and then had to go over to Liverpool Street. We you were never, getting kicked out too. I, yeah, we all oh, got kicked out. And do you know what? I stood, we had, here's a foot call. You got kicked out too. <laughs> I'm not actually answering the question, but this is, this is just 
cool, it's coming to my mind now, but I remember we used to fulfill our orders in a Narnia cupboard. It was like this like crappy little cupboard connected to the room and it connected to your office, JP. <laughs> and I would go in and honestly, the whole room was like this big. And I remember taking everything apart and I remember like le shutting the door behind me and thinking, I, w I wonder what the next few months hold for us. Like right. what does the next year hold? And, and no one knew. Um, but what we, what we ended up doing right. is... Um, you know, for seeing, I think for, for us, we were thinking, oh my goodness, is anyone going to be buying jewelry right now? You know, we, we have an average price point of about £100. It's, it's something that you do need disposable income for. Um, and so we came up with another idea um, to advance our mission, which is to help the majority of people feel recognised. Right. Um, and we came up with chocolate. So we launched the viral chocolate bar campaign. Well, it wasn't viral to begin with, but then it went viral. And we basically said to the British public, who do you want to recognize and why? And all they had to do was comment on our Instagram post, tag someone and say, I want to recognize this person and why. And before we knew it, we literally had essays from people saying, I want to recognize my friend at home who's been furloughed. I want to recognize my mum who's on the front line and, you know, it's been really hard for her and la, la, la. Anyway, when they recognized them, we got in touch directly, like each person we did this for, we, mm -hmm. sent, we got in touch with thousands of people and we asked them what their favorite chocolate bar was. And then we sent to them, I wish I had a photo, we sent them in the post their favorite chocolate bar at, with a card that said, feel recognized. Mm -hmm. And on the back it said, um, you have been recognized, know how hugely valued and appreciated you are. Um, like we're gonna get through this. And you know, something as simple as a chocolate bar was that recognition that people need it yeah. um, and it changes people's day and and I think that was the beginning of realizing that recognition is so much greater than just jewelry it really right. is just a vehicle that we can use to help show people mm. love and and you know you've, you've mentioned a few things already um, obviously recognize has had some great success you've sold you know, easily over half a million pounds of jewelry and um, you know, but you've also had, as you've described, some really difficult challenges. As, as, as a founder, maybe you could share with us, how do you stay resilient when you kind of keep having these real big challenges and, and how do you keep going at it for the next new challenge? Yeah, I think one of the biggest lessons I've learned over the last three years is that as a founder of a startup, mm -hmm. you're, you are your ability to continue and your will to keep going and pushing forward is, is arguably the most precious resource to your startup. And ultimately, I think that's where, you know, rubber hits the road and that's why resilience is so important mm -hmm. because if, if you're not in it, <laughs> who's going to advance what you're trying to do at, at that stage? And so, you know, I think, did you ask about retail or just resilience in general? Resilience. Resilience, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I mean, uh, I practice it in a few ways. Mm -hmm. So... For me, the first thing is about mindset. I often think with resilience, it's a lot more about what's going on within you than what's going on around you. Mm -hmm. And so obviously, I mean, retail business in the pandemic has been <laughs> something to really, you have to be resilient for. Right. Um, but I think, yeah, I think my first thing is mindset. And so, you know, your, your mental health, your physical health has to be so sharp because that's where your decision making comes from and that's mm -hmm. where your resilience comes from. And I think a lot of founders have to learn the hard way that they that they that their wellness is more important than what right. they do. And I've learned that the hard way. I was, I got pretty much burnt out by the right. start of 2021. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, you just have to take those moments and think actually, business is about staying in it as long as you can to advance right. what you wanna do. And so what's the point if you <laughs> can't stay in it? Exactly. So I think that's one way. I think the second way is finding um, your champions mm -hmm. who are going to believe in you more than you might believe in yourself. And mm -hmm. so I have one of my best friends um, also runs a business. And often when we're both having like these really crap days, we'll call each other and it'll be like, you can do this. <laughs> like, get back up there. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. And also they're the people that remind you what you need to be reminded of. They're the people who are like, what are you talking about? Like you did this this year. Like look how far you've come. And then you can get back in the ring. Right. I think the third thing is purpose. Right. Purpose drives your fulfillment, which drives your resilience. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a reason that you're getting up in the morning, then... I just don't know how I would do it. Okay. You know, stories right. like 
the woman I told before. It's those mo- it's those moments. I mean, it's been really hard. You know, it's been really hard. Absolutely. You know, this year has been the most brutal year um, for retail, but particularly for our business, it's been so hard. And um, actually, having those moments where you think I'm actually doing it for the Dylans of the world and the Judys and all these all these names that you meet. And everyone will have a reason for their why and the reason they get up in the morning, right. but that that is the thing. All right, so th- thank you. Thank you for that, Annika. Tell, um, my last question, can you uh, tell us what's next for Recognized? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we are discovering creative ways to motivate people towards acts of compassion mm-hmm. and to help people show love and give recognition. And so, you know, taking, like we did with jewelry, like we did with chocolate, we're really expanding um, into other product categories, taking the concept of recognition to become the most meaningful gifting brand in the world. And that is, that's what we're doing. And we're currently raising funding for that. So we're looking for investors. Um, and that's, that's our big focus right okay. now. Yeah. Thank you. Can we give a big round of applause to Annika? Oh, I'll say that. Right. And if you're interested in understanding more and experiencing a little bit about what the recognized products are like, we do have a mini pop-up over here on the right. So uh, after the presentations tonight, please go and have a look at uh, recognized products. Uh, It is my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, one of our founders from Cohort 9. Please welcome Susie from Family Flow. founder of Family Flow. Here I am, age five, snuggled up in between my two older sisters. But brace yourselves, because there is a trauma. When I was 11, my middle sister, Judith, the one on the left-hand side in the kind of green dress, she died of cancer, age 17. But this isn't a story about grief. You're very welcome to join me in my therapy sessions for that one. This is a story about the stories that we all bring to the table as adults and where they come from. Because they bend and shape our well-being for the rest of our lives. For any parents here in the room, we know that we bear that responsibility in turn. Because we have to nurture our children's emotional well-being because it sets them up for the rest of their lives. If I can make this work, I didn't have success earlier. There we go. But back to me as an adult. I won't lie, my own journey as a parent isn't always easy. Here's the gang. There is plenty of crazy in our family. And along the way, I've trained as a family psychologist and coach. And let me tell you one thing. Parents need more. They don't just need more, they want more. The Bezos Foundation tells us that 73% of parents uh, find parenting to be their greatest challenge in life. 69% of parents wish they had more positive strategies to help them on their journey. And get this, 86% of parents in the wake of this pandemic feel overwhelmed. That's 86%. It's huge. So any employers here, any friends of parents, let me tell you, we all need more support. It's a huge market opportunity. But it isn't just the parenting piece. As parents, when we become parents, it's, it's a springboard for adult development. So there's a whole heap of work that we need to do on ourselves and in our relationships to get the best out of our family lives. So... Enter the Family Flow app. It wasn't supposed to change. Um, (laughs) So the Family Flow app gives parents uh, instant access to a toolkit and a team to to ease their parent journey. And it couldn't be more simple. Let's have a little look. So... Because parents are at the heart of this, we give parents a survival kit, front and centre, 
They've got meditations, mantras, and knowledge to help them with the issues that are important to them on, in their growth. It does have a high degree of personalization because we know that every family is different and there's no point in showing information about toddlers to parents of teens. And we also know that parents are very short on time and energy. So we give them, we cur curate and we create bite-sized uh, tips, tools, tricks and insights. And we provide it in audio, video and text format so that parents can access the knowledge and the resources they need in a way and in a, in a time that suits them. And also for parents that like to, uh, who love a live, they can attend live events. So they can go to workshops, they can go to live Q and A's, they can attend summits with the best minds from around the globe at a time that works for them. And a small but important point, there is a family hub. So parents can save and share content that is relevant to their families with their co-parent, because that's one of the issues that families often have, is they need to stay on the same page. And beyond this, so when knowledge and resources just aren't enough, and it's very common, we often all need more. We provide a vetted network of the best minds and uh, preferred, pre preferred providers from around the globe so that parents can connect with them and do the bespoke work they need to when they want to. So, why does it all matter? Why does creating thriving families matter? So let me tell you this. If we do the work inside families, if we give parents personalized knowledge and support to get the best out of their families in this crazy and complex world in which we're raising our children, then we increase individual and collective feelings of well-being and better mental health. We then sit in the space of doing the preventative and not the curative work which has far-reaching benefits. Not least that it reduces pressure on GPs and mental health services. And for many people here now, and we've just talked about it, the world is in a mental health crisis, and particularly for children and adolescents and young adults. But above and beyond that, if we get this right and we do the work inside the families, we create children and adults who feel better, they do better, they go out in the world and they model pro-social behaviours and we end up with what we all would love to see, which is a world that is kinder and happier. Nirvana. <laughs> so, never mind what families need. What does family flow need? So, how are we, we going to change the world one family at a time? So, the app is currently in development, but we do need money behind us to help launch. And we also need a brilliant marketeer. So if there's anyone in the room here or knows anybody who has the finance and or the marketing skills to join the team or help back us, then please come and talk to me afterwards. And failing that, if you're a parent of 0 to 18 year olds and you're interested and you think I've got the answers that you need, <laughs> then come and talk to me afterwards and give me your email and we can um, keep you up to date with how we progress. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs> We are now coming to our last presenter from Cohort 9. And so without any further delay, please join me in welcoming Sophie from Switch It. Hello, everyone. My name's Sophie Cowan, and I'm founder of Switch It. It's very hot outside today, wasn't it? Anyway, um, you might look at these pictures and think you're coming to another doom and gloom talk about climate change. Wildfires, starving polar bears. Well, I'm not going to tell you about these pictures this evening, because I'm pretty sure everyone in this room understands that we're in dire straits. But what I will tell you is that big oil companies have extraction plans that are identified, put in place, and are waiting to be financed, that if realized, 
would exceed global climate targets by three times. So if there's two things to take away from this presentation tonight, the first would be that the climate emergency is way more urgent than we might believe, and that we can do something that's way more impactful than we might have thought. And the answer is in your pockets. Let me explain. Switch it is a simple, effective tool for climate action. We are here to support thousands of people to use the power of their money to move markets, to shift and make the change that we really need. A little Genesis story first. How did Switchit come to be? Well, I spent the first few years of my working life in London in the shiny Soho advertising land. A few years in, the glitter wore off slightly and I realized that the world was burning up. Perhaps something that many of us may have experienced as well, that kind of progress of realization. You may remember in 2019, if you were in London or perhaps looking at the media, that a pink boat popped up in Oxford Circus. Uh, Waterloo Bridge was covered in trees and thousands of people came together in civil resistance at the government's inaction on climate change. Uh, a few months earlier, I'd met a small group of people planning on doing something big. I set up and ran the media team for Extinction Rebellion and together we launched the movement onto the global stage, pushing the climate change emergency into global consciousness and leading to governments worldwide declaring a climate emergency. So naturally, amongst my friends and family, I became the activist, anyway, um, and the go-to for conversations about environment and climate. They'd say, I get it now. Climate change is big. What can I do? So I said, well, get out on the streets. Glue yourself to a road. Maybe smash some bank windows. Direct action works. It has a history of success. Let's get on with it. No, thanks, they said. <laughs> there wasn't much uptake. So I realized that people, certain people, many people, really wanted to take impactful action, but that direct action wasn't for everyone. But we needed something impactful, perhaps a little bit less radical. It was around that time that I met my co-founder, Anna, who's based in the States, and together we found the answer, financial markets. Follow the money. Money makes the world go round, et cetera, et cetera. We've heard, I think, many of those phrases before. But perhaps we haven't heard the fact that in fighting climate change, it's 21 times more effective to move your money than it is to go vegan, quit flying, and using public transport for a whole year. Enter, switch it. People can have a hugely positive impact with the choices they make with their money, but perhaps they just don't know. Only one in five HSBC and Barclays customers are aware that their banks are funding fossil fuels in their name. Switch it makes the action simple. It overcomes the barriers that inhibit many customers from moving their money across financial institutions. It provides full information, it makes it easy to do, and it's simple and effective to track the impact. And fundamentally, it's a clear call to action, because in a world where we're potentially overwhelmed with choices of climate action, but many people really want to do a good thing, 
we need something that's a clear and simple call to action that's perhaps a little bit more impactful than buying a bamboo toothbrush. So, on switchit.green, you can find out if your bank, energy provider, or pension provider is funding and supporting the fossil fuel industry. And by signing up, you can take part in the action to switch it out. A user dashboard is created, key actions are laid out simply, and the switch is really, really easy. Tips and tricks, resources, supportive help along the way. Our business model is based on commission for the, from the recommended providers that people switch to and financial advisors that we refer people to too. And we're beginning to roll out programs with businesses and universities in order to, they will be with a fee as per the business model, but in order to maximize the participation in order to maximize the impact. Switch it is a business that could create much better business. With the revenue that we bring in, we can amplify our message and rocket the impact. Oh. So what is the impact? Well, so far, we've supported hundreds of people to switch 450 million pounds worth of lifetime deposits out of fossil fuels into greener providers. Our aim is to support hundreds of thousands of people to shift billions of pounds out of planet-harming institutions into those building a better future. We know that consumer action, consumer choices, will shape markets if targeted effectively. Our users' actions at scale will put financial institutions under pressure to shift their policies towards those that will create a more livable future. The more people that have access to the tool, the higher that impact will be. and the market. When presented with the fact that their money is funding fossil fuels, 18% of the UK population said they would switch their bank in the next year. That's 2.4 million people. Ooh, I didn't switch that, but it's the last slide. Um, so we have a massive opportunity in this room to support people, hundreds of people, thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people to take one simple action that will move markets to deliver a more livable future. So my ask here this evening is whether you consider yourself an investor, an ambassador, a marketeer, an interested party, perhaps your business would be interested in getting involved, perhaps you're part of a university, perhaps you're just a human with a bank account. I'm inviting you to get involved. There are three, th three key things that we need at this point. The first, resources and or connections for a really banging marketing lead, please. Second of all, resources and or contacts for a tech dev to ensure that the tool is of high conversion rate. And thirdly, for this evening, my ask is that everyone in this room has a go at maximizing their climate impact by 21 times. By going on to switchit.green, finding out if your money is supporting fossil fuels, and signing up to take action to change things towards a more livable future. You don't have to change your life to change the world. Switch it. Thank you. We are looking for founders for our September program. So if you know any purpose-driven founders that are wanting to scale their businesses, then we'd love to meet them. All you need to do is um, send us an email. There's a QR code. There should be a QR code coming up. Um, 
scan the QR code that takes you through to a landing page with all the information of our September program. We'd absolutely love to meet some more. So technically applications are closing tonight at midnight, <laughs> but um, if we get them by Monday morning at nine, then we'd be really happy to accept them. And then secondly, this is a bit of a cheeky one, but um, if you don't ask, you don't get. Um, we are looking for a home for Impact Central. So do you know of anyone that has any space, any space anywhere in London that we could use to bring founders together? Uh, we would love to host our program. We've been doing it hybrid, that's worked really well. We'd love to continue to do that. We'd love to create a space for um, events that we can bring the community together more regularly on, on doing this and meetups on a more regular basis. So if you know anyone that um, is in property or know of a space that we might be able to um, take over, then come and talk to Gordon or Ian or me at the end. But thank you so much for coming. Um, and one little thing for you, maybe as you're going into this next section, um, turn to your neighbor and ask them what is filling up their hope tank right now. Thanks and come chat to us later. <laughs>